So everyone, my name is Giacomo Calabria. As I mentioned, I'm a writer under the pen name Jacopo della Quercia. I've written several novels, several hundred articles of both um, uh, fiction and nonfiction, and I've written several shorter works. In addition to this, I'm also a um, scholar of the humanities with Humanities New York, which is the New York State branch of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And for that reason, I decided to have a little bit more of audience participation when it comes to this program. When it comes to emotional judo, wrestling with character internals, uh, I'll be honest, I chose Cobra Kai because it's something where I thought that um, many of us would be fam familiar with it. Some of you might have joined this simply because of Cobra Kai. But I also chose it because it's something where it breaks a lot of rules when it comes to storytelling for reasons that we're about to go in here. So because of that, as I said, I really do want this to function a little bit more like a classroom than is a simple um, lecture or a YouTube video. So I really do mean this. If you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, if we're not able to get to them, feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me. I would love to hear your thoughts and uh, offer your commentary on this, not only when it comes to Cobra Kai as a Netflix series, and not only when it comes to Cobra Kai in terms of writing, and of course the Karate Kid when it comes to writing, but really just um, when it comes to pop culture studies and even psychology. This is going to be covering a very large canvas of subjects that I myself am not an expert in all of them. So for that reason, I would love to hear your thoughts on everything when it comes to what we're discussing. So that said, um, I did have a video that was produced that um, gives a very brief background on what we're going to be talking about. We will be discussing Cobra Kai, but I want us to begin by discussing the four personality types. Now, very quickly before I go into that, uh, just so everybody knows, Cobra Kai is uh, the Netflix streaming series, which originally started off on YouTube Plus, which followed the character of Johnny Lawrence after the events of The Karate Kid. Uh, the Karate Kid, as I'm sure all of you know, is the Academy Award-nominated um, 1980s you know, feel-good sports film where Denny LaRusso, outsider from New Jersey, moves over to Los Angeles, finds himself bullied, and is able to learn um, Okinawan martial arts from uh, his sensei, which is um, Mr. Miyagi. And it's worth mentioning that Mr. Miyagi is actually a composite character who it looks like he's made out of several people, um, several real life figures, uh, specifically the character of Chojin Miyagi, who's actually the founder of Okinawan, uh, an Okinawan martial art known as Goju-ryu Karate Do. Goju-ryu, which I actually studied and I found out the writer of the Karate Kid studied, it actually, um, it translates into hard and soft and all those elements that you see in Cobra Kai and the Karate Kid wax on, wax off, that's from uh, Goju Ryu. They make a few, they take a few liberties when it comes to the katas, for example. But my friends and I, uh, we studied um, Goju Ryu when we were in college. We would watch The Karate Kid and afterwards we'd yep, that's, um, that's Nikawashi Dashi, that's The Stance, that's uh, Kata Seunshin, what have you. So there is a pretty good martial arts background when it comes to the show. Um, this does not mean that the martial arts are the kind of things that uh, you get a good education by watching the program. I'm just saying that this is the foundation for the show and also uh, very much like Rocky, which had come out earlier and of course had won the Academy Award for Best Picture and was even directed by the same director as the original Karate Kid. Both films are following a sort of a uh, Horatio Alger myth about someone who is a younger, poor person who really comes into a very challenging environment. And the myth is that through their work and perse perseverance and pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, they're going to be able to overcome their adversity. The reason why I'm saying this is because The Karate Kid is an old type of story. And it's also, during the time in the 1980s, a very popular American type of story. So what we're going to be doing is, um, when it comes to The Karate Kid, I'm going to be going into a little bit of the reasoning over why The Karate Kid and, by association, Cobra Kai is so successful and why the characters themselves are so relatable. And it's because of their usage of, or really uh, their, um, how should I put this? It's really how they align with a very classical approach, not only to storytelling, but also to ancient medicine. 
which is referring to uh, the four personality types and also the four temperaments. When it comes to the four personality types, the four personality types uh, go back to ancient Greek medicine, specifically Hippocrates. So the idea with the four personality types, and really the going back to ancient Greece, the four humors, it was believed that a, um, any type of illness was caused by a disbalance of these four different types of humors, by which I mean substances that made up the human body, uh, yellow bile, red bile, blood, etc. And so the idea is that um, if someone had an excessive amount of this, they might be a little bit more ostentatiously one particular personality trait. So as a result, someone might become more in, uh, introverted or extroverted based on an excess of this particular makeup. Now, as time went on, this went from being a medical approach to a little bit more of an artistic approach and going on into um, really all the way up to the Renaissance and afterwards, we see that in many different types of stories, in, um, in more modern times of work of film and literature, we see different characters that correlate to these personality types the same way that a person might uh, resemble these, uh, these personality types. And the easiest way I can summarize these are the Ninja Turtles. You know, that, you know the part in the, um, the titles where they go, you know, Leonardo leads, Donatello does machines, Raphael is cool but rude, Michelangelo is a party dude. Those are the four personality types. In a T, it cannot get any easier than that. Four personality types are the Ninja Turtles. We're about to go into them. So in this visual that you see over here, we see uh, for essentially an X and Y axis that is broken down on uh, stability and um, introversion and extroversion. So the idea is that if someone is sanguine, which is the red quadrant in the bottom left, the person is extroverted and emotionally stable. So this is someone who, using the Ninja Turtles, this is Michelangelo. So he's someone who is sociable, outgoing, talkative, uh, responsive, easygoing, lively, carefree, and they also demonstrate sometimes leadership. Now, just so you know, there is a little bit of overlap. Not everybody uh, really meets this personal, uh, like exactly. When it comes to Leonardo leading, he's clearly the leader in the group. I actually think it'd be hysterical what it would be like if the Ninja Turtles were led by Michelangelo. But nevertheless, that's a party dude right over there. And when it comes to characters, many characters often resemble this uh, when it comes to storytelling who are young and a little, you know, just a little green. And, you know, and it's worth mentioning that Michelangelo is also the youngest Ninja Turtle. So for that reason, reading this, I personally see a lot of Danny LaRusso when it comes to this, especially when it comes to the original Karate Kid. He is someone who is very um, social. He talks a lot. He sometimes gets in trouble because of that. He starts off as pretty easygoing and laid back, and things get a little bit more um, troublesome. And basically, he's forced in a position where he needs to grow and mature because of the environment around him. And when we look at uh, going around the quadrant to um, Choleric, which is the yellow quadrant, this is Raphael from the Ninja Turtles. This is someone who's touchy, restless, aggressive, excitable, changeable, impulsive, optimistic, and active. And for me, in my assessment of the Karate Kid, this is Johnny Lawrence, who um, it's worth mentioning that when it comes to those who are extroverted and also emotionally unstable, uh, we see many villains who have this personality, but at the same time, we also see many teenagers who have this personality in literature. This is someone who is essentially growing up very quickly and is sort of asserting themselves. When it comes to character internals, which is the source of our conversation, this is where we might see almost like some, some kind of a dynamo inside the person is like motivating them to go forward, just driving them like a piston. We don't know what it is. Is it hormones? Is it trouble at home? Is it just, you know, a desire to be taller, be stronger, what have you? There's many different factors that go on to this. And speaking as a writer, uh, collar characters are usually the most fun to write. Like, in my personal opinion, like this is Han Solo. Uh, this is, you know, like, um, as I mentioned before, this is Raphael in the Ninja Turtles. Uh, this is someone who is really in a position where they're going through a lot of personality changing and a lot of struggle. So for this reason, you can have, you know, very colorful dialogue with this character. You can have them being very aggressive, being very hot-headed, and it's going to be very true to their character 
because there's a lot of people who are like this at that, at that particular stage in their life. So moving on to the top left quadrant, we have the melancholic. This is Donatello. Uh, these characters are usually more um, isolated. They're sometimes inventors. They sometimes demonstrate incredible skill when it comes to that. These are people who are emotionally unstable or, in, oh, oh, sorry, emotionally unstable and introverted. So they are moody. They are anxious. They are rigid. They are sober, pessimistic, reserved, unsociable, quiet. Now, when it comes to Cobra Kai, I personally see that um, I see a little bit of crease when it comes to this figure and a little bit less so when it comes to the Karate Kid film, because it's worth mentioning that crease, he's probably best as a character when he's just standing in the background and watching and brooding. He is someone who, despite the fact that, you know, he's incredibly violent, he, um, the, in the beginning of the Karate Kid part two, he tries to kill Johnny Lawrence which is one of the most traumatic moments in Johnny Lawrence's development, not simply as a character, but as a person. That he is someone who, in, in my opinion, when it comes to really just the, the mechanics of the storytelling, he does have leadership quality, he does have aggressive qualities as well, but for the sake of this conversation, he is someone as a character who is most commonly used as being a looming adult figure in the background who is usually watching and quietly manipulating things. And the last one, the uh, phlegmatic, this is your Mr. Miyagi. This is someone who is usually a very old person in storytelling, in some cases literally near death. And this is someone who is passive, careful, thoughtful, peaceful, controlled, reliable, even tempered and calm. And also going back to the Ninja Turtles, this is your Leonardo. So this is your old reliable, someone who is, you always know what they're going to be saying, even if, you know, even if you don't know the old, the words, you know, they're always going to be there to help you if you need them. And um, these are just very common times, leaders or parental figures or guardians in storytelling. So having all this on here, and I've actually done this with my own writing, sometimes if you're writing a story, an easy way of keeping track of your characters is by just downloading this image or having it open on a tab and revisiting it now and then. This is a very handy way of making sure that your characters are consistent going through. But this is what's very interesting about what Cobra Kai does when it comes to its characters. Unless, so, like, the Karate Kid does touch upon this, but the Karate Kid doesn't go into it as good as uh, Cobra Kai does. What Cobra Kai does that I find particularly interesting, and I believe is one of the main reasons why the show is so successful, is because it gets these characters, it gets these personality types, and it shows them changing. And not only does it show them changing, it shows these character types changing with struggle. There's consequence, there's birthing pains that go with it. So what you see over here is a more artistic approach to the four personality types and the four temperaments. And it essentially shows, uh, one, the earth elements that were associated, well, I should say the four elements that were associated it when it came to ancient Greece, which is air, fire, earth, and water. But also when it comes to the stages in a person's life and even the seasons of a year that were associated to them as well. When it comes to spring, when it comes to childhood, this, like, these are the individuals, as we were saying before, who are sanguine, who are a little bit more childish, your Luke Skywalker, your Michelangelo. Unsurprisingly, they represent springtime and childhood and essentially, you know, an air of happiness and openness and amorphousness. You know, they're very... They're in a position where they are very changeable. And the reason why is because they're sharing the world with so many more established characters as well who are influencing them. When it comes to yellow bile, which you can see over here on the left, that's summertime, that's manhood, the element that's associated with it, the classical element is fire. This is the reason why we see so many of these characters literally giving fiery speeches, 
why we see them being so angry or aggressive. They are essentially young adults who are entering adolescence or who are, you know, coming into this new body and they're showing their strength, all these kind of things. These are the internal motivations that these characters have. The idea is that they are this way because there is something in their composition, literally in their physical corporeal body, which is motivating them to be doing these personality traits, these conflicts, what have you, whether they even know them or not. Then continuing on here, when you come to the earth element, these are the melancholic. These are people who typically are more at advanced stage of age. They're slowing down a little bit. They might become more introverted. They might become inventors. They might become scholars, what have you. And lastly, when it comes to uh, the phlegmatic, uh, shown over here with the element of water, these are people who are usually very old or even near death. So these are, you know, you're incredibly old, wise people. This is your master Yoda. Uh, to some sense, this is like your ghost of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And also this is your Mr. Miyagi, who's the oldest person in there. So what's so very interesting about Cobra Kai is it gets, if we can just go back to the previous image, it gets these initial personality types, these characteristics that Danielson, that um, Johnny LaRusso, that Mr. Miyagi, all these characters had in the original film, and it shows them changing in the storyline. It breaks the format that I just talked to you. And this doesn't happen too often in storytelling and succeed. Sometimes this happens in storytelling and it comes off as an, as an inconsistency, like a character was not properly fleshed out. It might come off as a little chaotic or worse. Probably the worst thing you can do is it makes characters sound the same. The different thing, though, when it comes to Cobra Kai is it shows different characters changing their personalities, but it shows them with very realistic struggles. Specifically, when it comes to Johnny Lawrence, he's someone who started off as choleric in the very, very beginning of Cobra Kai. When we see the flashback to the all Valley Tournament. He's someone who, as mentioned, he's touchy, he's restless, he's excitable, you know, he wants to fight, he wants to win this tournament, defend his title. And what does he do? He becomes so melancholic. He literally disappears for 20 years and, the, and hysterically is portrayed as someone who almost doesn't even know that the 90s or the aughts even happened. He's just thrown in the modern era. He does not know what the internet is. He just, you know, He's still listening to White Snake and still watching all these 80s shows. Essentially, he has completely gone into a very introverted, borderline hibernation, which is a very clever way of using the passage of time between the Karate Kid films and also the Cobra Kai series to comedic effect as well as storytelling effect. I mean, Red Letter Media described what Johnny went through as... A little bit of like an Al Bundyism, where you have someone who is. Um, and by the way, I, I will recommend that video for those who are interested. Red Letter Media, it's a YouTube comedy channel. They have a video called a review, R E hyphen view, of Cobra Kai, and they have a very good background on there when it comes to the development of the Karate Kid series and also the Cobra Kai series. If anyone's interested, um, I recommend that video for fu for uh, future viewing. But as I was saying, when it comes to Johnny, what's interesting with him and with many of the characters on Cobra Kai is unlike a more shorter film such as The Karate Kid, which is, you know, only about like two hours, less than two hours, it makes sense that in a two hour story, you're going to have characters really uh, essentially occupying one of these four quadrants for the short amount of time that you have to tell the story. When it comes to Cobra Kai, it's different because it's going to be a, a streaming series. You're going to have hours to tell your story. You're going to have literary opportunities where simply because of the mechanics of the storytelling, you're going to be fading in and fading out. Stories have to have a logical conclusion, a beginning and an end in the 20-minute or the 30-minute time that you're telling an episode. So for this reason, Cobra Kai, unlike the Karate Kid films, allows for much more character development and also character transformation. And what makes for good storytelling is we see these transformations not happening easily. If you can picture it, each of these quadrants is almost like it's the person's character. It's their home. It's everything about them. 
And for you to take them physically from one to another, they're going to resist it. They're going to say, no, this isn't like me. I'm not this kind of person. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a leader. I'm none of those things. They're going to be fighting and kicking and screaming. And thus, you're going to be seeing characters who are behaving almost like chemicals in a chemical experiment or a chemistry experiment, by which I mean, if you're treating characters so consistently, whenever you mix them together in a scene or in a story, what have you, they're going to be behaving in a way that is volatile because this is how they're supposed to react. If you put a choleric person in the same situation as a melancholic person, the person who's the teenager, the aggressor, the person you know who's the hothead, the Johnny Lawrence, they're naturally going to be aggressive because that's what they do. They're constantly asserting their authority. They're trying to you know say that they're the strongest kid in the playground. They're the best person in the dojo. And then if you're putting them in if you're essentially putting them in contact with an actual adult or an actual master, it's going to make sense that they are going to be coming into conflict because they're usually used to pushing around the smaller and the weaker and the more sanguine characters than the more melancholic characters. But as I said, Cobra Kai starts off with Johnny in a flashback where we see him as a younger person who is more choleric, more aggressive, more, as I said, more adolescent. And then we see him in a completely melancholic depression. And what's so interesting about the story is it succeeds at being able to have many characters at the same time going through different personalities. And when it comes to the character internals, what's motivating them is that when it comes to the two main characters, specifically uh, Danny LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence, in both The Karate Kid and also in Cobra Kai, it seems that the main motivating the main motivating force that they have, the impetus that's driving them into this transformation, both in childhood and adolescence and also in adulthood, it seems that it is a lack of a parental figure, specifically a father figure. In both cases, we're seeing characters who have lost their fathers. And when it comes to Johnny, it's never someone correct me if I'm wrong. If I've watched the series several times, it doesn't seem that we're outright told what happened to Johnny's father. If, if I have this incorrect, drop it in the chat. Let me know otherwise. I watched it several times specifically looking for this. It looks like his father is, for lack of better terms, not in the picture. And for that reason, he has a terrible relationship with his stepfather that eventually motivates him into joining the Cobra Kai dojo and thus looking upon Sensei Kreese as a father-like figure. This actually goes in line with what... Uh, Sensei Miyagi says in the original Karate Kid that there are no bad students, there are simply bad teachers. Johnny Lawrence is an excellent student when he's young. It's just he is studying a teacher who is unfortunately warping his students and giving them very dangerous um, advice. When it comes to Danny LaRusso, he similarly has lost his father. It's made more clear in Danny's um, storyline in the Karate Kid that his father is dead. So it's not going to be like maybe in season four, we might actually see Johnny Lawrence's father. Full disclosure, I would love it if Johnny Lawrence's father turned out to be played by Ed O'Neill. Just a little Al Bundy showing up. He's actually his father. That's what I would do if I was writing this. That said, moving along, when it comes to uh, the motivating force and the character internal struggle that Danny is going for, he's in a position where he needs to find someone not only to, say, physically protect him, he needs someone to teach him how to be able to protect himself. And that's where Mr. Miyagi comes in, playing the very classical role of a teacher, a mentor, a father figure, an Obi-Wan, a Yoda, what have you. So what's so interesting is in Cobra Kai, we're shown that despite the fact that they enjoyed, um, when it comes to Danny, despite the fact that he enjoyed successes in his youth when it came to his karate tournaments, when it came to uh, his real coming of age in Okinawa, when it comes to all of this, we see that they were actually temporary victories. Because in adulthood, just as Johnny is still struggling with his failures from his youth, and in a way, also fighting with his successes in his youth, having been someone who had won the tournament before, having been someone who viewed himself as, you know, on top of the world from his perspective, then crashing down, Daniel is also forced into a position where he realizes that his victories were short-term. Were short the difference is he, Danny, 
is in a position where he wants to become the father figure that he had through Sensei Miyagi, but he believes he is not able to. Whereas when it comes to Johnny Lawrence, it's the exact opposite. He's someone who, through Miguel, is essentially occupying the same role as uh, Denny LaRusso uh, in his youth. We have Miguel wanting, uh, wanting Johnny to be his teacher, and Johnny's rejecting, saying, I don't have the money, I don't know what I'm doing yet, you know, you're wasting your time, it's not going to be able to help you, etc. Thus, we see two characters simultaneously trying to face the same struggle, only with different motivating reasons behind them, because they're suffering from different wounds from their childhood, which works incredibly well. And not only a martial arts uh, movie, but in one that is based on an Okinawan martial art that literally translates into hard and soft. The whole idea in Okina in um, Goju Ryu, which, as I said, is the basis for what they call Miyagi Do in Cobra Kai. The idea of Goju Ryu is hard and soft, be basically being very relaxed when you're moving, and then being very hard and intense when you're delivering a punch. If I'm not mistaken, when I studied it, I was told that this was somewhat derived from the yin-yang. But at the very least, this whole idea of being hard and soft is different from Cobra Kai, which is always strike hard, strike often, no mercy. Thus, we see the two of them in a very, very simple, and I'm being honest, in a very essentially stereotypical storytelling, occupying yins and yangs, good and evil, etc., but the story does become more developed when it comes to addressing how there really is no right or wrong or good or bad in Cobra Kai. Because Cobra Kai shows that much like real people, characters, as are humans, are capable of developing during time. We see Hawk go through an incredible transformation where he starts off as someone very introverted and he ends up becoming someone who is very choleric. He becomes someone who's very excitable, who's changeable, who's, you know, he goes through this great transformation. He's occupying the role that originally uh, Johnny Lawrence was occupying in The Karate Kid. And he becomes uh, initially like one of the, I believe he's considered to be the second best student. When it comes to Miguel, who, even though he's someone who is being bullied, he starts off as being very sociable. He likes, you know, talking about his movies. He likes, you know, being very nerdy with his friends. He is very easygoing. In his own environment, Miguel is someone who is very happy, very relaxed, and very childlike. He's forced to go through a development. But when he goes through the development, he's born again hard, and he occupies a position of leadership, where even when he is physically injured to the point of near paralysis, he is still occupying this role in the storyline, which is important in the sense that he's someone who is now more passive, more careful, more thoughtful. As I said, look at that image. Whenever you are crossing one of those black bars in these four personality types, in Cobra Kai, it hurts you and it changes you. And the reason why it does that is because it's good storytelling. This is a good way of showing how difficult it is for anybody at any age to be going through a major transformation. So, with all that said, that uh, is basically my uh, crash course when it comes to uh, emotional judo, grappling with character internals. I know that we spent uh, probably more time talking about character internals as well as externals, but I want to make it very clear that when it comes to these stories, what really works in terms of Cobra Kai is that they still have these characters that are motivated by internals that do not change too much. Daniel wants to become the father figure that he had in Mr. Miyagi. Danny is forced to become the father figure that he never had in both Sensei Kreese and also when it came to his own household. And it is also worth mentioning that for those of you who are watching Cobra Kai, Please understand that it's not a flawless work of storytelling. Uh, personally, I think that there's many rooms for opportunity when it came to developing Danny LaRusso's relationship with his son. We spend so much time with Danny, you know, trying to be a good father figure and also a good leader, both um, to his daughter Samantha and also when it comes to the Miyagi Do Dojo. But personally, when it comes to his son, who's barely uh, treated as a character in the story, it almost makes sense that if we're approaching this like a scientific experiment, we should expect Danny's son to be going to someone who is not Danny as he gets older for protection, for revenge, for a parental figure, etc. 
Thus, using these personality types, we can sort of predict where the storyline will be going. It would make sense if Danny LaRusso's son ends up joining Cobra Kai in season four. It would make sense if someone like Hawk ends up becoming much more phlegmatic or much more internal because he just went through radical transformations and unlike other characters, he reverted back to the way he was and is now in a position where possibly to atone for his past mistakes, he's going to become more reserved and more peaceful. We're going to be seeing, and of course, when it comes to characters that are more secondary characters, in many cases, they don't change. Moon is totally like Mendic in this story. She's so, she's essentially a hippie. She's careful, she's peaceful, she's trying to make peace. She is in a position of leadership, trying to get people together, hosting parties, etc. So what I'm saying is, in all of these different aspects when, it's, when it comes to storytelling, these four personality types are very good bedrocks when it comes to developing who characters are. And Cobra Kai is one of the few examples that exists in mainstream media where we see all these different types of personalities rapidly changing and the story getting away with it. It is difficult to have your characters change so profoundly. But when you're able to pull it off, it's quite a storytelling experience and one that we can all learn from as storytellers. So with that said, does anybody have any questions or comments or really observations? I want to hear your own thoughts. Does anybody have anything they would like to share when it comes to everything we discussed or with Cobra Kai in general? So moving across black lines, you're talking about the first image. What about moving from water to cold? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. If we go to that other image, uh, if we could, the one with the blue background. Uh, yes. yes, when it comes from, yes, thank you very much. When it comes to that, uh, usually the way that it works, and this is really more applicable to Cobra Kai, that there are some characters who occupy both characteristics. They may be more one than the other, but uh, usually when it comes to characters that are just very, very rigidly like air or like fire or like earth, or specifically who are very choleric or very melancholic, they usually don't change too much. A character like Donatello in the Ninja Turtles, he's always going to be inventing because that's what he does. He's an inventor. Someone like Doc Brown, who occupies that same position, we can't picture Doc Brown unless he has the crazy hair and the time machine and making those inventions. It's so much a part of his character that it becomes destructively out of character for them to be changing who they are. However, there are characters who either through our development of them or in how they actually are, that they don't rigidly occupy one specific area. So as a result, when it comes to them going over to wet or going cold, it makes sense for a character to be able to slowly transition in terms of personal development or even in terms of regression one way or another. Or furthermore, they may even get along with someone who is of a different uh, element that's closer to them. Part of the reason why Luke Skywalker is very close to Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi, whereas Luke initially is somewhat repellent when it comes to Han Solo. So for this reason, we're able to see that those who do sort of straddle the line, it makes sense that they could go one way or another. And sometimes they'll actually be going through a major struggle over what are they going to do. Should Luke's, is Luke Skywalker going to remain in childhood forever? Is he just going to become a farmer and never leave? Or is he going to be, you know, joining the space pirates and, you know, going off the planet, doing the kind of things that all these people want to do? Luke Skywalker is in a position where he wants to allow himself to change. It's just as we learn in The Empire Strikes Back, that is quite dangerous. When someone like Luke Skywalker becomes aggressive and impulsive, it could destroy the entire galaxy because he can end up becoming a Sith super weapon. So as I said, and this is very common in Cobra Kai, we do see some characters who truly do not belong in one of the quadrants and who temporarily do ride that line when it comes to a different personality type. The thing that doesn't change though with Cobra Kai, that going back to the main subject of the story works so well, are their character motivations. In many cases, Johnny Lawrence, Danny LaRusso, they're hitting brick walls essentially. They're trying to do things in a very rigid way and it's not succeeding. So for that reason, they are allowing themselves to be changed, which works very well because both of them share elements when it comes to a choleric uh, characteristic, which is 
the they're in a position where they are allowing themselves to be changed. Someone like Mr. Miyagi is never going to change. Someone like Kreese might change, but it may be a farce or maybe something doomed from the beginning. And also, characters like Daniel's mother are never going to change. She's essentially the same character she was in the original Karate Kid, and it's great seeing her again in the storyline. You know, she's still you know, standing by her son, keeping family together, you know, still completely unflinching when it comes to her love for her son. There's nothing wrong with the character being somewhat one-dimensional when it comes to that, because in the real world, there are people who are changing and there are people who are consistent. So I hope I was able to help with that question. Uh, do we have any others? Yes. What did you think about the foreshadowing of Hawk's transformation at the end of season three? Did you feel that was earned or established leading into the fight? Okay, so um, uh, speaking personally, uh, when it, well, to answer your question, uh, when it came to the foreshadowing, seeing that coming, I did see that coming more so because, in my opinion, Cobra Kai, about halfway into season two, started falling into one of the pitfalls that many of my favorite um, television programs are, in that it became a show. And when I say it became a show, what I mean is the show has to go on and it's going to continue indefinitely and definitely until it's no longer profitable. And this is one of the criticisms I personally have had when it came to Stranger Things. So, and again, I'm not discounting anybody who is a huge fan of uh, any of these shows who are fans of Stranger Things or Downtown Abbey or anything, or Downtown Abbey, I should say, or you know any of these series or Game of Thrones. It's just the, the reality is when it comes to telling a story where you don't know how it's going to be ending, one of the main motivating factors is going to be having the show continue. And as I said, one of the great strengths of Cobra Kai is that they have characters going through transformations. And when it comes to conflict that um, the really the incredible conflict that I personally identified very much with when it came to Hawk how he's someone who changes his hair more than once. It's in his character to continue to change. So even going back to that initial foreshadowing, we should expect him to continue his evolution, especially in a position at the end of season two, where there's a leadership vacuum, when there's a lack of Miguel. So I personally was not too surprised when it came to that. He, in my opinion, uh, would have been expected to change. What I'm curious about is what is his last change going to be? Because in my opinion, looking at um, these different personality types and also looking at the more supportive role as a supporting character that Hawk demonstrates, despite the fact that Hawk is one of the most um, physically violent characters in the show, I personally, based on how these characters are designed, we should expect him to be a little bit more peaceful and conciliatory, possibly frightened about martial arts going into the later seasons because he's in a position where he did almost an about face. He almost didn't cross a line. He essentially dove across that chart, which is usually very, uh, basically, it's usually something that's very aggressive. You shouldn't be able to go, uh, you shouldn't be able to jump two black bars, I should say. So he's someone who, in my opinion, looking at this as a storyteller, I'd probably say that out of all the characters in Cobra Kai, I would say Hawk is most likely to die. And the reason I say that is because, as I said before, cholera characters are fan favorites. They're ones who are usually the most fun to watch or they're very fun to write. I mean, when it comes to Hawk, I mean, he's, he's borderline campy. I mean, his tattoo makes a sound effect. That's hysterical. I love that. I was, you know, <laughs> alongside everyone. I loved seeing that every time he showed his tattoo and you heard that, uh, that Hawk is screeching. If you're going through a story where these characters are growing up and they're becoming adults... Eventually, in the real world, adults are going to die at some point, some of them before their time. So that's my personal take on it. His evolution is expected. We should not expect it to end because he, unlike other characters, changes quite a lot in the story. The question is, what is his final form going to be? All right. And for next question, uh, what about the characters who are pretty cold? Which area do they belong to? Referring to the photo with the elements. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, yes. So, um, 
going back to the elements, um, now when it comes to someone who is very cold, and by which I'm cold, we mean, say, uh, emotionless, unflinching. Now, the truth is, you can be that way and you can occupy many different um, elements when it comes to personality types. Someone like uh, Roger from Lord of the Flies, for example. And it's worth mentioning, Lord of the Flies, they also have characters that do a very good job occupying these different positions. Uh, Roger, you can sort of figure out by process of elimination, he is not sociable. He's someone who is not calm. He's like he's not emotionally stable in any way. He's emotionally unstable. So boom, that forces him over to one half. Now, with that said, that means that he can either be very extroverted or very introverted. And when it comes to really, um, how do I put this? When it comes to characters who are essentially there to get punched or who are essentially there to stir up the pot a little bit, they usually don't go through personality changes because one, in the real world, there's people who don't go through those personality changes. And two, there's characters who further point in the story, they are not supposed to go through changes. All right, one of the greatest additions we ever saw to the Star Wars storyline in the sequel trilogy is we actually saw a stormtrooper going through development. We saw um, Finn going through a personality change and also personally an emotional journey as a result. We don't know how many stormtroopers might have gone through that storyline for, but this is one that we are following, and as a result, a little bit like Cobra Kai, it's rewriting the script. It's turning not only a hero, I'm sorry, it's turning not only a villain, but a previously defeated villain into someone who is sympathetic and even, you know, the star of the show. So when it comes to um, those types of characters, as I said, it's very handy to simply have them occupying this one corner. In X-Men, Sentinels are almost always just going to be robotic. They're always going to be, um, you know, they're always going to be melancholic. They're going to be emotionless, thoughtless, and unstoppable. That's how the foot soldiers are going to be. That's how so many expendable villains and storylines are. And as I said, there's really nothing wrong with that. Emperor Palpatine, who's one of my favorite characters in fiction, he's actually a very one-dimensional character. You know exactly what you're going to be getting with him. He's someone who is always going to be evil. He's always going to be brooding. He's always going to be somewhat flamboyant. Like, you know, he'll start a thunderstorm in the background just for dramatic flair. But it works with his character because... In this universe, where all these people are being changed and manipulated, he's the one person who's not changing. And as a result, it makes him a different tier of villain. We constantly see um, storylines that have different types of villains, and which I'm, I'm actually a big fan of, because in the real world, many villains double-cross each other. Many people are betraying each other, taking advantage of someone's desires, or they're being blackmailed, what have you. And when it comes to having a character who is rigidly in one position, such as Moon, using her as an example from Cobra Kai, she's always going to be peaceful and very reliable. And she's always just going to be like this, this calm pond in this complicated ocean of adolescence. And it works pretty well because it's somewhat hysterical. After spending so much time watching these uh, young people fighting each other in malls and over at school and over in karate tournaments. The idea of Moon somehow being unchanged by all this, which sometimes happens. I mean, you only have so many hours in the day and so much drama you can handle. The idea of her trying to very peacefully quiet everything and just say, come together, it's hysterical because, as I said, if we're treating this like a chemistry experiment, we know there's going to be an explosion, despite her trying to put a blanket on top of it. All right, and our right. next question was, can you ever combine traits, different quadrants of point of image to the element one? Um, you can. I mean, there's no law that you have to have a character be exactly this way. Uh, again, I mean, one of the best examples of this, and um, there's much more detailed writing on this than anything I'm going to be able to cover in one hour. When it comes to Star Wars... Uh, the original Star Wars, uh, Episode Four: A New Hope. Part of the reason why that film enjoys such worldwide acclaim is because those characters occupy essentially um, 
quadrants and characteristics that are classical. They're very familiar characters to us. And for that reason, it's going to be something that is very familiar. So I would say Star Wars more so than other storylines doesn't have a lot of crossover when it comes to those. Now, when it does come to crossover, as you were mentioning in the question, um, yes, it is... I mean, somebody naturally, if they're going to take like a personality test, they're not going to be 100% in one of these uh, four different quadrants. If any of you want, you can take one of these personality tests and see how you line up. The question is, what's going to be the most dominant thing about them? Captain America is a soldier. He's killed people. In some cases, killed people horrifically, like thrown them into a jet engine or to, um, you know, a helicopter blade. That is horrifying, but it's not what determines the character any more than um, some other act, any more than Indiana Jones in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade firing a bullet that goes through three people. A horrifically act of violence, but it's not what determines who he is. What determines who Indiana Jones is the fact that he is someone who is somewhat spiritually a skeptic. He's someone who um, is, you know, someone who is emotional in a way, someone who is motivated possibly, well, not possibly, someone who is motivated by a lack of rapport that he had with his father. All these different things are what determine the character. It's not simply a checklist where you're like, all right, well, I've done this. I'm no longer melancholy anymore. Or, you know, I've uh, done, my character has done this one thing. What it really comes down to are twofold. One, are these aberrations in these times where they're jumping across a quadrant, is it in their character? Is it something that's fleeting? Those are the kind of things that we should be asking themselves when it comes to, is this simply an action that they're doing or is it determining the character? Because if you're having someone as a character be presented as being all over the place emotionally, but essentially everyone else is that way as well, that's a sign of poor storytelling because you're essentially allowing what should be these very deep elements of a character be essentially a wash all over the place. As I said, what Cobra Kai did is very difficult when it had to characters changing their personalities. The reason why it's very difficult is because you really need a deep understanding for the characters in order to understand why they would be going through those changes. And that is what we have when it comes to the Karate Kid films. We know the bedrock, we know the story, where otherwise if it wasn't for the Karate Kid films, we wouldn't be able to fully appreciate the character of Johnny Lawrence or of Denny LaRusso. So like I said, what it really comes down to is you have to understand what are the main motivating forces behind your characters. What is their DNA? What are the parts of them that are not going to be changed? Because they can exhibit characteristics that are different to them and also different to other characters like that, as long as it's something that is treated as an aberration, either something that is out of character at the time, or it's going to be something that is not going to determine the character indefinitely. All right. We have one more question. Um, it might be a tad spoilery, uh, but going back to the idea that this show has become a show, do you think there's a fulfilling way to wrap up Cobra Kai before it lives long enough to see itself become the villain? Uh, you're asking the wrong person for that question. Because <laughs> per personally, personally, listen, I mean, I really, I mean, really when it comes to the young actors and actresses in Cobra Kai, I'm very happy for them. I mean, this is a wonderful opportunity for them to build a career. They're, these are such interesting characters. I personally view Cobra Kai season one as, I personally view it as a proper sequel to the Karate Kid part two. I mean, less so part three. Part three, a lot of people don't like to talk about part three, but essentially I, I really view the Karate, I, I view Cobra Kai one as occupying a very good continuation of the Karate Kid franchise. Everything after that, I view almost as akin to a spinoff. As I said, it's continuing the story. So my personal opinion, I believe it's essentially already outgrown itself and become a little bit of self-parody. Now that said, if we were gonna be wrapping it up, I mean, hell yeah, they still have opportunity for fantastic development. As I said, if I was in charge, if you know, if Netflix gave me a sweet deal and I was in charge, I would say, we're gonna have Ed O'Neill play Johnny Lawrence's father. We're gonna bring him in there. We're gonna have Johnny and we're going to have, um, we're gonna have this fantastic fight at the end. 
where we have um, uh, Kreese and Green and all the villains from the Karate Kid franchise are all going to get together for this one fantastic fight. And basically all the good guys and all the all the good girls, they all get their asses kicked. And then through the door <laughs> comes Ed O'Neill saying, Polk High School, 1966. And basically defeating Sensei Kreese. And then Kreese is like, why do you care about him so much? And he says, I'm his father. That's what I would do. We need all right. So to answer your question, when it comes to how's it, what's a good way to wrap it up? We need to see Johnny and or Daniel get what they want in the sense that their their motivating forces are having a parental figure or the father figure that was lacking to them. If we're able to see a very satisfying way where Johnny uh, does get that, then I feel that would wrap up his entire storyline, and thus there would be no need for a continuation of Cobra Kai. I love that idea. Uh, you heard it. Ed O'Neill, he's a good actor. He he has a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's appropriate that he would be there. I would I would cast him as Johnny Lawrence's father. And awesome. And if possible, I would make him as much like Al Bundy as possible. It's <laughs> great. I, I don't see any other questions. So do you have any last comments before we wrap up? Uh, just my thanks to um, your help and your patience when it came to organizing this. Um, but to everyone who was here, thank you so much for attending. To everybody at Right Hive, thank you for all the organizing that you're doing. And um, really, I appreciate this very much. And it's been a pleasure to have your time. Thank you for coming. We've, we've enjoyed having you as one of our speakers. Thank you very much. Best of luck, everyone.